I want to share a favorite story of mine. It's about um, going to test out if you're going to be able to be part of a monastery, okay? And it's kind of a favorite story of mine because, you know, when I had more time, every year I would go away somewhere all by myself, leave the family behind, and have a week of silence and solitude just to recharge, just to listen to God's voice, just to get direction for my future. And on one of those occasions, she asked me if I wouldn't be happy in a monastery. Okay? So anyway, this is a story about a novice who undergoes a novitiate program. Um, This is where you go in and you test out to see if you're suited for monastery life. And this was a very strict monastery. In fact, um, one of the rules was silence and solitude. And uh, for him, while he is uh, being um, prepared and tested, uh, the rule was that once a year, he would come before the head of the monastery, and he would be able to express himself or ask questions, anything he wanted but he was limited to two words, okay? So he came in and he spent his first year and it was time for the evaluation and feedback meeting. And the uh, head of monastery says, well, what do you want to say? And the novice said, bed hard. Okay, so he used up his two words. Goes back second year, the meeting. He comes before the head of the monastery, and the monastery says, well, and he says, food cold. (laughs) All right, not going so well. So finally we come to the third year, and he's hoping he's going to change his tune, but when he gives his two words, you know what they were? I quit. Okay? And the head of the monastery says to him, I'm not surprised. Ever since you've been here, all you've done is complain. Okay? Um, You know, this novice is Jacob. This is just the way we see Jacob near the end of his life. In Genesis chapter 47, we see that Jacob is still like a spiritual novice, one who is weak in the faith, one who still is struggling to grow, to change, to be the kind of man who will be the father of faith to the Jews. Because what he does is he comes before the Pharaoh, when he first enters into the promised land. Now, you have to realize, you know, as you have been following through this whole series, all the times God was so good to him. He meets him on the run at Luz and shows him a tremendous vision that has been so immortalized in the art of the Western world seeing the staircase with the angels coming down and going up, and then God coming to speak to him, promising to take care of him. And this is the first time he comes to know God. But later on, while he is in Haran, living with his father-in-law, he goes through so many trials and tribulations, and yet he escapes them all and he prospers. And so God has been shown to be uh, exactly what he promised. And uh, so... He comes out and he has the narrow escape from his father-in-law. Later on, he has that miraculous change that he saw in his own brother who had threatened to kill him. And then, you know, skipping ahead to this part of the story, he thought he had lost his favorite son, child of his 
favorite wife, Joseph, by the treachery of Joseph's brothers and half-brothers. And uh, basically, um, he looks back and he thinks, well, you know, life is tough. And what happens is a famine hits the land. And in the process of trying to buy food, they run into Joseph again. And Joseph invites them. In fact, Pharaoh invites them to come to the refuge of Egypt, the only place that was doing well because of the intervention and the wisdom and the, uh, the uh, vision that God has given to Joseph. So there he is, and he shows up, and he meets the Pharaoh for the first time. And so we're in Genesis 47, verses 7 to 9. And I want you to read along silently with me, and you see what he says. And it kind of reminds you of the old Negro spiritual Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrows. Because this is what he said. Then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, and he goes beyond the question, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Then he has this, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. He says, hey, you know, my father and grandfather had a lot easier. Why has my life been so difficult. And so he comes and he says, basically, you know, looking at his life and he sees the misery and he's just without any gratitude. Well, no wonder. You know, this guy has been the kind of guy that Galatians chapter 3, verse 3 talks about. Starts off well in the work of the Holy Spirit in the power of God, but then he starts to take over and he tries to run his life his own way. And so Jacob had this wonderful promise and prophecy given about he would be the one to have the birthright, to have the blessing, but he starts to try to take over on his own. And, you know, there's a story about a man who's doing a painting, and he's not finished yet, and he's working on this painting, and he puts down his brush, and he goes to bed. And at night, the figure in the painting looks around at the painting, and he says, you know, I think I can do better. And he steps out of the painting, and he takes up a brush, and he starts to work on this thing. And he has no artistic skill, no sense of where the painter was going, nothing. But he thinks that he's going to try to do better. The result is he basically defaces that painting. And comes back the next morning, it's a mess. This is what Jacob has been doing with his life. Instead of trusting God to lead him, as instead of looking at what God is doing. He tries to do so much his way on his own. And what's the result? He looks at his life and he says, you know, it hasn't been nearly as long as my father, my grandfather, and it's been terrible. Well, this is how we find him. Seventeen years later, his life comes to an end. He dies at the age of 147. And when you look at his life objectively from the Bible, you know, he has only three years less than his father's. He sees his family safe and secure under the protection of Joseph and Egypt. 
He sees his household getting larger and larger. And uh, in his final breath, he gives the prophecy in the blessing of his children, telling them about their future. He's doing the work of the patriarch and helping to strengthen their faith. He is, um, does some very special things with Joseph and his two sons. And instead of being called Jacob, the wrestler, the conniver, the one who is the taker, you know, at this point, the Bible starts to consistently call him Israel. Okay? So he is now a new person. And the result is he's going to be mentioned so many times in the Old Testament. And finally, when you get to the Faith Hall of Fame, you find Jacob being mentioned. And this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. And this is an interesting verse, verse 21, Hebrews 11, 21. And let me read it to you. And you see two things are mentioned in this chapter, which is the Faith Hall of Fame. Okay? These are the great examples of faith in God's people. So verse 21, it says, By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Now that doesn't sound like much, but yet God picks this as his significant action that makes him eligible and should be mentioned in the Hall of Fame. Um, there was a time when I was reading some books on management and leadership and how to organize one's life and be purposeful and, you know, to do your best. And um, one of the things that was a question that was given to us to consider was this. Very interesting question. The question is, who is going to come to your funeral? <laughs> okay? Now, that's a very un-Chinese way of planning your life. But basically, what it was saying was this. We grow up under a lot of different influences. We grow up under the influence first of our parents, perhaps especially our mom. Then later on, we grow up with the influence of our spouses, right? Many of us are influenced by our bosses. We seek to please these people. And the question says, do these people really count? Do they really matter? Think about which ones really, really matter. Who are the people who are going to show up at your funeral? These are the people that you should be living your life trying to please trying to be in a good relationship with. You can't please everybody, and these are the people that really, really matter. And so, um, anyway, in the end, that's true. But there's one further one, the person whose opinion matters the most. And who is that? Yeah, God, right? Because in the end, after the funeral is when it really, really, really counts. And so at that point, you have to think, have I pleased him? And so this bad boy that we've been talking about, this Jacob, who is so frustrating and so inept, yet in the end, he makes it in, and this is the opinion that God gives to him. And we want to look this morning at why? What has changed? Because in 17 years, he's gone from being the complainer to the guy who makes it into Hebrews 11 and is noted for these two specific things. So that as his body declined, his spirit was increased and awakened. And so I think what's happened is this. In these 17 years, as he's sitting there, in Egypt, isolated from the Egyptians. 
he realizes, as Pharaoh has told to Joseph, I'm going to put your family in Goshen. And Goshen was a place like the promised land should be. It's going to be a rich, lush place. And the Pharaoh says, I want to put you there because I want your family, your father, to eat of the fat of the land. And so he's sitting there in his comfort, his safety, while the rest of the world is undergoing famine, and he's getting a foretaste of the kingdom. And what this does, I think, for Jacob is it awakens him to God's goodness in his life. And he looks back and he retraces concretely and personally the experience of his relationship with God. And this is what turns him around. There is a real verse that is in John 17, 3, a real valuable verse, I meant to say. And it says this, John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The knowledge of God is eternal life. The relationship with God that we have is the life that we need. And so he comes to know God. And he reveals how he knows God in the events that Hebrews 11.21 points us back to. And this is amplified here in Genesis. In fact, that's where he does it. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 48. And we're going to see in chapter 48 how Jacob blesses Joseph and the two sons of Joseph, and then, in the process, how he worships. And in that, we're going to learn what he discovered about God in his life. Genesis 48. And uh, let me go ahead and start It says, after this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. And then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in his bed. And you imagine this old man who's just strong enough to do this final act. So with great difficulty, he sits up on the side of his bed, on the edge of his bed, getting ready to bless Joseph and the boys. And he needs the help of his staff in order to do it, in order to stay up. And what he does is he begins with something that is just wonderful. Starting at verse 3, he talks about how God has been with him and how God first met him and lose. He talks about the beginning of his personal relationship with God. Because up at that point, you have no sense from the Bible that he knew God personally. His father knew God, and he knew his father believed in God. But we have no sense that he had a personal relationship to God. And he starts, and he prepares the boys to be blessed. And he does two things, and I'm going to just summarize it. First, he's going to take Joseph, and he says, I'm going to bless Joseph. But he does it by blessing Joseph's boys. And what he's doing is he's doing a double leapfrog, because who's supposed to be the leader of the clan? The firstborn. That's Reuben. But Reuben and his brothers had all disqualified themselves in the preceding chapters by some terrible things that they did. And so he comes down to Joseph, the only one who has been honorable even when he was in Egypt all by himself and deserves to be the one who leads the family forward. But he knows that Joseph's going to die in Egypt. 
So he chooses Joseph's two sons. So that's the first leapfrog, all right? So he jumps all the way to child number 11 and makes him child number one. And child number one is supposed to get a double portion, right? So he's going to give a portion each to Joseph's two boys. But what he does is he switches his hand. Joseph tries to get him to unswitch it. He says, no, this is what God wants me to do. And so he blesses the younger boy. He says, because I can see in the future, God has given me this vision, and I know he's going to be the greater son. And so he blesses Ephraim over Manasseh. And just before he does that, uh, he, as he follows in obedience to God's leading, he tells them what he's learned of God. And this is where we come to the worship. So, Come down to verse 14, where we see his sense of God. And you will see that it's a poem. Verses 15 and 16, it is a poem. And it says, and he blessed Joseph, but he's actually got his hands on the boys. And first thing he says is, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, Then he says, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. And the third, he says, the angel who has redeemed me from evil, bless these boys. So the blessing he gives is not a whole lot. He gives this long invocation, this long preamble in which he recites his sense of these fathers. I mean, of of God. And the first one is the God of his fathers. He says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. And here's what he's referring to. Back in Genesis 17, 1, God gave a command to Abraham. He said, walk before me. And be blameless. Okay? Walk before me and be blameless. He expected that those whom he was taking care of would walk in such a way that their lives would be a testimony. That his life would show the reality of the relationship with him. And uh, so he says this is the first thing that I am part of this spiritual history, that the God who has been faithful and made this first promise to my grandfather and somehow still made it work for me, we are to be blameless in the way we live, that we are to change and not live any way, but we are to be those who will give glory to him. And so he's talking about his spiritual heritage And he's giving credit to them. And he's saying, this is the God who has called me. And I have a responsibility to walk the same way. Okay? So first he acknowledges his responsibility. You know, it's an important thing for all of us. That God not only loves, but he's called us to walk before him. You know? When I used to be a kid, walking down the street, of course, you get to that age where you don't want to walk next to your mom, right? You want to run ahead. You want to look around. You want to do all these other little things. You want to dwaddle. And my mom had a way. Somehow, even when she was behind me, I could feel her stare (laughs) if I was doing something wrong. And I would turn around and check, and sure enough, I can tell from her face that I was not walking before her blamelessly. And I'd adjust. I would correct. And you know, we have to remember that. And yet, it's a great source of comfort. Because I can still remember discovering when I was very young the reality of the God who watches over me. The sense of that. And having that sense 
kept me feeling very, very secure. I'll talk about that more later. But he's talking about knowing that God cares how we behave and we are to walk before him properly. Second, he talks about the God who's been his shepherd. How long? His entire life. This is the God who has always been taking care of him. So before he was born, right? God knew him, knew he was coming, and had determined that he was going to bless him. And that's the same with us. The God knew we were coming, and he has determined to bless him. And you think about all the frightful experiences that Jacob went through. And I love the phrasing here. He says, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. And I think of Psalm 23 in the closing verse where it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And he does. Through the ups and the downs, now Jacob finally realizes that this has been the reality of his life. Despite his failings, despite his faults, despite the many times when an ordinary person would have walked away from this project that never seemed to come together, God never abandoned him and took care of him, gave him the care that he needed. And I remember going through those experiences. I remember when um, I was young and I was at home, all alone, preschool, no TV to watch, nothing to do. So I hung out on the streets. And then it got dark and all the other kids were called home to dinner. And I went home and my mother had some rice and some steamed egg and that would be my dinner. And I'd eat it and it wouldn't take very long. And I'd sit there and I looked into the dark rooms because we needed to conserve energy, save money. So all the rooms were dark and there I am sitting there, looking at the dark, wondering what boogeymans were in those rooms. And you know where I sat? I sat right next to the front door on an old stool, high up, waiting, so that if a boogeyman came out, I was out of there. I was going to hit the road because I would always feel safer on the streets. And I think about that, I'm thinking, God, why am I not more warped than I am? You know, to live through that kind of a trauma. Little kid, defenseless. And yet God watches over us when we think about it. I was talking to another immigrant mom recently, and she talked about how when she came over and she had a 10-year-old and a 4-year-old And how she had to tell the older one that they had to be quiet and you had to keep your younger sister quiet because you're home all alone, just mommy, and mommy's at work. And if people heard you, they might tell the police and they'll take you away from me. I thought, wow. (laughs) You know? And yet, these girls are thriving. They're doing wonderfully. And so God takes care of his people. He is that shepherd. And the third thing he remembers and realizes about God is that this is the angel who redeemed me from evil. And so he evokes the angel. And he's had so many experiences with angels, including wrestling with the angel. And he invokes this deliverer who, when we really get into trouble, he comes and he doesn't help us to always avoid trouble. It says he redeems from all evils. And so somehow 
He takes us through the fire and he delivers us and makes us stronger, makes us more knowledgeable, right? We don't want to go through the hard times. We don't want to go through the struggles. We don't want to go through the times that we messed up. But we learned so much. We grew so much. It prepared us for the real growth to come, even if it's only in the last 17 years of our life. And God is so patient that he will wait 130 years of bad years for the 17 years of good years. I mean, he is a wonderful God. Okay? And so he comes to see this God, and he realizes how God has blessed. And finally, he moves from knowing the God of Isaac and the God of Abraham to knowing his own personal experience of God. God has now become real because he's traced God's work and presence and care in his own life. Now, Isaac would look back and he might not fix on these three descriptions of God. He might fix on some other descriptions of God different from this. Um, I'll tell you, looking at today's song um, and praise songs, we came to that second one. And if you look back, you might discover that God has been your healer. God has been your source of power. God is the one who opened your eyes, that your God was greater or stronger or higher are awesome. But see, it becomes real when you look back at your own life and your own history and your own experience and you say, this is a God that was in relationship with me through those times. And each of us would have a different composite sense of stronger impressions of God and knowledge of God and weaker things. And it's all God but it's God for us, God for me. And that's what we need because once we get to the point where we know our personal God, then we can be strong in our faith and we can be decisive in those critical moments. And so God is at work. He is faithful. He will bring us to the very end. The question is, are we looking back and appreciating God as he was in my life, in your life individually? Not how he was in Pastor Sue's life. Not how he was in some Sunday school teacher's life. Not how he was in your own parents' life. How was he for you and to you? And you can only do that if you pause, you may not need to take 17 years like he did. But if you take the time and think, who has God been? How has God been? What has God been for me? Then you have a sense of the personal God. And here's the thing. Here's the thing we need to remember. Don't wait until the final times of your life. You know, if Jacob had done this when he first arrived in Haran, if Jacob had done that when he first left Haran, so much of the agonies and the failings would have been minimized. And he would have been able to walk blamelessly before God, knowing the shepherd, knowing the angel who redeems when you mess up or when you're attacked, when you're in trouble, and his life would have been much more even, much more upward for a much longer period of time. And that's why we try to bring people to the Lord at a young age. That's why we want to have spiritual households Psalm 46, 7 says, The God of Jacob 
is our refuge. And I love the verse in Hebrews eleven sixteen. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And I think about that. God is not ashamed to be kin to use God. This little kid who came over from the old country, wearing hand-me-downs, growing up poor, speaking with a black Chinese English accent, being hard to be understood, God was not ashamed. And it's so wonderful that he is our refuge. And he is not ashamed, but he wants to do this for me. He wants to do it for you. If he'll do it for Jacob, he'll do it for any of us. And so come to know your God personally. If you, if I were to ask you right now, describe God to you right now, who is God to you? Most people have trouble going beyond a few sentences. They'll tell me what they heard in Sunday school. They'll remember some story from a sermon. You know, they talk about somebody else. But they can't explain God in their lives. And we miss out. And I don't want you to miss out. I don't want you to wait until the final 17 years. So that's what? The final 10th of Jacob's life. We don't want to wait until the final 10th. We want to have that personal relationship clear. Because it's already been happening. And we want to say, this is my God. Like we sang today. This is my God. Your God too, but your God's a little different. Your experience is a little different. This is my God. Okay? So, um, for Jacob, in the end, he went from rags to riches, spiritually speaking. And uh, we're so glad for his example. So encouraging for our lives. All right, we're going to go ahead now, and we're going to segue into our time of the communion service. We're moving into it a little early, but we're going to do it the same way because Brother Alex at the end is going to come and he's going to give us a report on the church family trip that we had last weekend.